uh, I want to introduce uh, uh, Professor Gita Tukiniok. Uh, she's an applied mathematician and she's very well known for her work in uh, many, many fields, including deep learning, harmonic analysis, image processing, computer sensing. Uh, I think she's currently Bavarian AI Chair uh, uh, for Mathematical Foundation of uh, AI in the um, LMU Munich Institute of Mathematics. Uh, she completed her uh, uh, doctorate at uh, Paderborn in 2000 with a thesis on uh, time frequencies analysis on locally compact uh, um, groups. Uh, she was supervised by uh, Professor Kanyut. And after some uh, traveling, I think, between North America and Europe, uh, she's now at LMU Munich. Um, Professor Kutinyok she has, is a member of the uh, Berlin Brandenburg uh, Academy of Sciences and Humanities since uh, uh, 2006 and CM Fellow since 2019. Uh, she was the eminent lecturer of the General Mathematical Society, Society in 2013 and has been uh, selected as plenary speaker at the 8th uh, um, ECM in 2020. She's currently vice president at large for CM. And I think I can stop talking now before I remove too much time to Professor Kutinyok. So, so thank you very much for being here. Okay, thank you so very much. So thanks so much for the invitation. Also, thanks so much for the very nice introduction. Um, it's really a great pleasure for me to give a talk here uh, in this, uh, at this Data Science Week. I would like to speak about reliable AI, which is uh, one key topic right now in this whole area of artificial intelligence, because this is the main problem right now that AI at this point is often not reliable or not reliable enough. So I would like to show you and discuss with you what reliable AI should entail, what successes we have, maybe where there are also open problems, and then I will finish with some profound or fundamental limitations, but also point a way out how we can resolve this problem. So, I think if we look around us, I mean, we see that basically, I mean, we are already uh, enclosed by artificial intelligence to a certain extent, think of self-driving cars, also robots are entering our lives more and more, also telecommunication, and then there are also very, even more sensitive areas like uh, the legal system, or for instance, also the job sector, where these type of algorithms are currently already being used. And then certainly the whole area of sciences, ranging from medicine over biology to astronomy. And for instance, in the Times Magazine, there was this article or this, um, volume which says artificial intelligence the future of humankind but then i mean on the other hand uh, there are also people who doubt in some sense that ai is uh, at present at a stage where we can already use it without any problems uh, so there was an incident just four years ago where one of the speakers who gave a plenary speech he even won an award uh, at one of the big AI conferences claimed that machine learning and so on, so artificial intelligence is still at a level of alchemy and there's a lot of trial and error, a lot of testing and, uh, for instance, also the training process. It's not really clear what is the best, let's say, architecture. So it's a lot of, a lot of trying out. It depends very much on the experience of the programmer. And there are certainly also people who are, let's say, and uh, go even more in that direction. Uh, so for instance, Stephen Hawking says the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Uh, so that's something very pessimistic. Um, certainly there are major advances and also uh, very, I mean, impressive successes. But one main problem, which is true, is the problem with reliability of AI. Now, so here, I mean, I think uh, from, from my viewpoint, four major directions in this area. Safety is one. So there were already various problems with safety issues, for instance, accidents which involved robots. One major direction is security. So you can hack into these systems, for instance, uh, into self-driving cars, taking over control. A third direction is privacy issues. Um, so the problem there is that Privacy violations, uh, for instance, in the healthcare sector happen on a daily basis and certainly nobody would like to use, to let their data being used for tasks which we did not agree upon. And then problems also with responsibility. Many of these algorithms are black box decisions and uh, black box uh, algorithms and decisions can be biased depending on the training data. So in that sense, 
I think it's fair to say that one current major problem worldwide is the lack of reliability of AI technology. And we need to tackle this to be able to fully use AI in also very sensitive application areas. And so sensitive application areas are, for instance, with what you see here, I mean, certainly the whole medicine and healthcare sector is extremely sensitive, but then also areas like, for instance, robotics, interacting systems, and also what now major companies or basically, I mean, almost any company aims to implement, which is algorithmic decision making uh, for certain tasks. Now, being from Germany and uh, living in Europe, we have here the AI Act of the European Union and the AI strategy of the German federal government, which both pose very hard restrictions on reliability of AI, but certainly, I mean, this is not the only country uh, and uh, also Europe is not the only continent which has such strict rules. But so this shows there's a great demand to go in this direction and discuss what reliability, reliability actually entails. So I'm coming from mathematics, so let me briefly discuss what the role of a mathematics per perspective is on this. There are certainly, we need to understand um, AI in its depths if we would like to make it reliable and there are different levels of understanding AI. There is, for instance, a heuristic understanding, one makes a few tests, it seems to work, and then one believes that it will always work in other situations, then there is a bit stronger understanding, which is an empirical understanding using maybe some statistical tests. But then often, if it's possible, a theoretical or mathematical understanding, which gives us very precise error bounds. This within model situations will tell us very precisely what the risks are and also how good this algorithm performs. And so one major problem, I think worldwide is right now, people typically aim for certificates for AI technology concerning reliability. And the question is, what are requirements for this? So if there is AI technology, what do we actually need to ensure that it's truly reliable? And so I would like to tell you a couple of directions, which I believe are important and also show you some examples in those directions. But let me start a bit slower. Um, introducing the workhorse for artificial intelligence, which is what we will now focus on, which are deep neural networks. So deep neural networks, I mean, most of you, I guess, guess know what those are, but let me just very briefly recall them. They're actually not new. This is an, an old idea from McCulloch and Pitts. They aim to introduce artificial intelligence and what they did was quite smart. We humans, at least we believe that we are intelligent. So it seems very natural to mimic the human brain. Now, the human brain consists of neurons. And so what uh, McCulloch and Pitts did was they modeled a neuron. So they created artificial neurons and then connected them to a neural network. Uh, so an artificial neuron you see here. So, I mean, uh, the whole talk is not overloaded with, with formulas, but here I just want to show you a couple of those. Um, so this is an artificial neuron, a very simple function. Um, you see here some, some free parameters, some weights, so-called bias term. And then here this function and so-called activation function. So this is a very simple function, which you can now concatenate. Um, you see this here to a neural network and then the resulting formula also has a very nice and easy structure. So uh, it's again a concatenation of here, these capital T's, you see they have this form, affine linear functions and this so-called activation functions, these rows where typically we now take a very simple function when we set up neural networks, just the max of zero and x. So that's the so-called rectifiable linear unit. So a neural network is, is basically a function, so it's um, accessible to, let's say, any also theoretical consideration, very beautiful framework. Now, what do we do? with a neural network, um, but let me first uh, just briefly say why they are so powerful these days. Because you see, I mean, everything started 1943, but at that time, I mean, we know artificial intelligence didn't see basically the light of the day, but what we see now, I mean, is it's tremendously um, effective. So what are these reasons? Well, now we have a increasing computing power so we can change deep neural networks and that makes a huge difference 
Um, so we can train neural networks with many layers. So if you go back, you see here, we arrange these artificial neurons in layers. And so now we can train networks with basically hundreds of thousands of layers. So that makes a huge difference as compared to 1943. And also we have a lot of training data. So the age of data allows us to have a sufficient amount of training data to really train these deep neural networks. And so what neural networks to take, I mean, there's a whole zoo out there and that relates to what I said before that um, artificial intelligence is at a level of alchemy. So people try a lot of different neural networks. It's not quite clear for particular applications what is the best neural network, but let me just say there's a whole zoo out. Convolutional neural networks, which is typically used for imaging, graph convolutional neural networks, which is used if your input are graphs, for instance, social graphs, residual neural networks, which also used for instance, imaging, units, which is used typically for solving so-called inverse problem, if you would like to invert a measurement process, generative adversarial networks, and so on and so on. Also, there's a whole world out there. So what do you do with a neural network? Um, so to get then to the, let's say, also key questions concerning reliability. So what you do typically with a neural network is you have a complicated function, which you want to learn. And so this function has some input space, maybe some images, and it maps it to labels. Huh? So let's say it's a classification function, and we have your images of cats and dogs, you see it's here, and maybe the cats are mapped to the value one and the dogs to the value two. But we don't know this function, we just have sample values. Huh? So we here have images of cats or images of dogs, and we have the correct label, either one or two. Now, from these samples, you want to learn F, and so we split these samples into a training and a test data set. The test data set we set aside and use the training data. So now we choose our architecture, we choose how we arrange the artificial neurons, in how many layers, how many neurons in each layer, and so on and so on. Uh, so that's, as I said, it's well, a lot of trial and error. Then we train it. Um, and so there are three parameters. There are these weights and biases, which we now need to learn and which we now need to match the training data, meaning we need to tune the weights and the biases so that if we put here our images, um, we get always the correct label out. So it's a lot of tuning. Then the network is fixed. And now we input our test data cats and dogs, which the network has not seen, and we hope that the performance is good and it's correctly classified there. So that's a typical workflow of using a neural network, and so from that we get the key theoretical questions and theoretical directions which we require basically for um, obtaining reliability. One direction is, as we said, um, we need to understand which architecture to choose, so how many layers, how many neurons in each layer, so this is a question about which aspects of a neural network architecture affect the performance of deep learning. So that requires several areas from mathematics, pattern analysis, approximation theory, and so on. So it's a pure approximation theoretic question. Then secondly, the learning algorithm needs to be understood. So why does this particular learning algorithm, which we typically use these days, which is stochastic grained descent, why does it converge to good local minima, although the problem is very difficult. Um, and there goes, I mean, also different areas from mathematics, optimization, optimal control, but also, let's say, more, I might say, exotic areas like algebraic differential geometry. And then certainly, I mean, what is often called the holy grail of um, understanding deep learning, generalization. So the generalization question asks, we train everything on our training data, but now we would like that the network also handles other types of data correctly, so it learns the correct patterns. Can we give success guarantees for this? So this typically requires areas from probability theory statistics. And so let me show you one example in this direction, because I mean, from my viewpoint, this is one key part concerning reliability. Now, 
what is what is the key question in this uh, generalization ability? What one observes is that neural networks, which are extremely large, perform very well. So therefore, also these big companies like Google and so on, they have a huge advantage because they can train massive neural networks. So it's and it's not really clear why this is the case, and that's still not understood. But let me show you a figure which actually shows that indeed, I mean, there's a big mystery here. And let me first explain the figure on the left hand side. Um, so what you see here, so this is all in statistical language, but let me walk you through that. So here we have um, the size of the neural network. So here in statistical language, the capacity of the hypothesis class, but here's the size of the neural network, and here's the error. Now, as the size grow, the training error goes down because the network can fit the data better and better. But the test error after some point goes up again. And this is certainly a problem. And this is the effect of what's called overfitting. Now, so the, the training algorithm aims to do a too good job and encloses the data in a too good manner so that if you then have new training, new samples, um, new images, then it's easy to misclassify. Them. And this is completely understood by statistical learning theory. But now this is not what happens these days because with neural networks, you see what you see here is basically this side. But now with neural networks, we have also this right hand side. And what you see here is as the size of the network grows further, the test error again goes down. And so this is not completely understood why this is the case. So this is a big old mystery. And so therefore, if you ask someone which size of a neural network should I choose, then typically you are told choose the largest which still fits in your GPU. And so this is this effect here. And people aim to explain this. There are a lot of different directions which people go, we see dimension, Radamacher complexity, neural tangent kernels, and so on and so on. So let me show you one, one example where, I mean, this problem can be solved completely. It's a special case, but I think it's a, well, maybe interesting example because it also takes us now to a very popular choice of neural networks, which are graph neural networks. So graph neural networks act on graphs. They have graphs as input. So you see a graph and at each node, you have feature vector. And then you have the connection between the nodes. So you have the feature vectors, and then you have here the connections. Now, so this is basically then the input to your neural network. And so the graph signal, as said, is a function on each node which maps to the feature vector. And this is extremely popular because there are tons of applications in this direction. So you see here, for instance, recommender systems, fake news detection, chemistry, and so on. Now, certainly you can ask also this question about generalization for graph neural networks. Now, so it's exactly the same question as in Euclidean domain, so in RD, but there is an interesting special case. Now, so this is a classical form of generalization, should generalize to graphs and signals, which it has not seen in the training data and which is only in the test data. But now you have graphs, which for instance, look like this. And you see these graphs seem to be a bit alike. Now, so they seem to come from somehow the same phenomena. That can be made precise, but so you can imagine, I mean, these two graphs, they are somehow similar. They are maybe sampling of the same continuous space. And so therefore, if you would like, if you have one of those in your training data, then the network should be able to generalize to all the others, which model the same phenomena. Yeah, so that's in some sense, the special case of the general situation. So you have classes of graphs which model the same phenomena. And if you have some of those in your training data, then the network should also handle the others well. Um, and so this can be solved completely. Um, so if you take a look here, I mean, this error, this is what's called transferability, this error which you make if you put in now an, a graph from, a, from the same, let's say, class, 
you can estimate precisely. And this is also what I mean by an error bound. You have a very precise um, bound for how good the neural network can do in this case. Uh, and so this uses a lot of mathematics. I mean, it uses specific filters. Um, it also uses a specific, let's say, type of what it means that two graphs belong to the same phenomena. I mean, a lot of functional analysis. So in this case, I mean, you can solve this generalization question completely, but in general, it's still a wide open problem. And so this certainly is one issue concerning reliability, because here you would like to really have error bounds on this. So because, for instance, I mean, if you talk to colleagues in um, electron tomography, they don't have a ground truth. So if they don't have error bounds, they don't know anything, uh, how, good you, how good the result is in the end. Then another um, aspect of um, reliability is you would like to also explain the result. Yeah, so here you have error bounds, how would you do? But here you would like the network basically to reason why a certain decision was reached. That's explainability. And this is also from my perspective, one key aspect of reliability, because this will ensure that it's not a black box that you can access how decisions are taken. So let me also give you a glimpse on this. Um, Professor Kutniok, may I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, when you mentioned, so now you mentioned explainability, right? So yes. the answer uh, that you, uh, you know, uh, recalled uh, before about, uh, you know, get the largest network uh, uh, that the GPU can uh, run, I don't know to say, right? That, other, that, that however, doesn't take in consideration explainability. That takes in consideration in general simply accuracy of the algorithm. Because of course, uh, when you try to, you know, uh, without thought, just increase the size of the network, either, mm -hmm. you know, size or whatever, then of course you're not taking in consideration the problem of explainability. Is that yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. It's, it's a separate problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm, I'm just, I mean, what, what I just said is, um, so if you would like to have reliability, I mean, or a certificate for reliability, you might want to have different aspects. You would like right. to have certain error bounds of your algorithms, but then you also would like to be able to explain results. Right. Also, from my viewpoint, it's, it's a different aspect of what you also need to have reliability. Right. In fact, in fact, those are two concepts which don't come in the optimization. So, you know, the accuracy comes in the optimization procedure, while often the explainability doesn't, is not included somehow. Yeah, yeah exactly, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah good, think. thank you. Yeah. Okay, so what we want to understand is how the network operates. Why is this important? I mean, I already explained this to a certain extent. I mean, since the network is very good in detecting patterns, um, you could even by analyzing how a network reaches decisions, get additional insight into your data. Yeah, so for instance, I mean, skin cancer, the network is really good in this. So you could even, let's say, see maybe additional features which relate to uh, that uh, cancer has been, um, has been developed. And you can also, as said, understand how reliable the result truly is. So again, relating to reliability. So the vision for the future is certainly you would like to have explanation to any question a human can ask neural network. And maybe also then the network hopefully answers maybe in a certain also human-like manner. And we are very far from, from both of those here um, at this point. So explainability, what, what does it do? Um, so this is a very simple example. You have a network which classifies this as a three, let's say, and then you want to know why it classified this as a three. And the explainability approach maybe outputs a heat map like what you see here. What would it mean? It means these red pixels, these are crucial for the decision of the network. So this is where the network looked at mainly, and also maybe this area here. And maybe these blue parts um, play against the decision, but that also makes a lot of sense because here these these red parts, these openings are important for classifying this as a three because it distinguishes this from an eight. But I mean, there are a lot of open questions. So what exactly is relevance? What are optimal relevance maps? And typically people these days look at mm -hmm. images, but I mean, we have a ton of other training data 
um, and other data which we want to analyze, this also needs to be taken into account and maybe also higher level explanations. And this is something which um, is also often overlooked. The explainability approach itself needs to be reliable yeah? because, I mean, you also need to trust the explainability approach and explainability algorithm. So one example of what we what we introduced was um, an algorithm based on what's called information theory, weight distortion theory. So what, what, what it does is you have here, let's say in your network, you have your original image and you have here, let's say another person who has the same neural network and according to information theory, so taking this as a backbone, the question is now what part of the image can you transfer to this other person so that it's still recognized in the same way. Uh, and so these will be the main, the pixels relevant for the decision. Uh, so here, for instance, the neural network would say this is a monkey. Now you would like to transfer parts of the results to this other person who actually, to be able to use the neural network, needs to obfuscate it first, maybe with just random pixels, not distort the meaning, and then hopefully gets a similar answer. Uh, so that's this rate distortion viewpoint. You want to transmit very few pixels but the error which you make should also be small. Okay, so you have some, some mathematics in the background there. So this error which you make, the expected distortion you see here, the difference of phi of x, phi of y. And um, so then what you aim for is you would like to have very few pixels, but the error should be controlled. So this is ideally what you want. Unfortunately, this is, very hard, it's NPP hard, so you can show that you cannot compute it, and so you can relax this and obtain a minimization problem of this type. Uh, so this is what we call right, distortion explanation. So here you have um, the, the, the distortion, the error, and here what you now ensure is here you had, if you go back, you had either a pixel belong to this important set or not, but now what we have is we put on each pixel a relevant score. Uh, and so what we aim for here, the L1 norm promotes sparsity. So we want to have a very concise explanation. And so this is, for instance, what you see here. Here, a network classified this as a dog. And you see different explanations here. And here you see, for instance, ours, which is very sparse, very few pixels in the explanation. but it shows basically where the network looked at to reach the decision. And what you also see is now, if you compare all these different approaches, um, then with very few pixels, you get also very, still a very good distortion. So just a very small error. So these pixels are really those which are key for the decision. Okay, so now this, this you can actually generalize this idea. First of all, you can wonder why to obfuscate with random pixels. You can do it a bit more smarter and for instance, use an in-painting gun to obfuscate it with more natural images. And you can also get higher level explanations, not pixel-based explanations, because you can wonder why should a one pixel be important or not. It could be that maybe a cluster of pixels is important. And so here, what we what we can do is you can decompose, for instance, the image in terms of so-called wavelets, and then put the relevance score on the coefficient, meaning on a cluster of pixels. And so here, let me just show you two examples. Um, here this is an example to understand seemingly wrong decisions. So this comes from telecommunication. What you see here is a city map. These red dots are cell phone users. This white blob here is a cell tower. And the network now computes this black and white background, which indicates at each point how strong the signal is. So you see the signal here is really bad, which makes a lot of sense since you have a lot of buildings in between you and the cell tower. But this black area doesn't make any sense because if you stand here, you stand right in front of the cell tower. So here the network seemed to have made a mistake. And so you can ask how the network came to that decision. And here you see the explanation. 
So the network based its decision on these cell phone users and these VLACs. And in fact, these cell phone users have bad reception. And what turned out later on was there was a building missing in the city map. So the network actually did a correct decision. Only the data was flawed. So this you can find out with, with these type of approaches. And this is now understanding wrong decisions. So here the network really, I mean, made a wrong decision, a wrong classification decision. Here, the network, which we now analyze, said this is a diaper, although obviously a man with a dog. And here the network said it's a screw, although it's obviously a man with a sweater. And now I will overlay it with the explanation, and then you will see what the network actually saw to reach that wrong decision. So I will put it on top. And so you see here, this looks a bit like a baby. So then a diaper is not that far off. And this, in fact, looks a bit like a screw. Yeah, so with these higher level explanations, so this is based on a wafer decomposition of the image, you can actually reveal what the network has seen to, in this case, which wrong decision, and then based on that, maybe improve the algorithm. OK, so let me also um, briefly point out because I think that's the main area, how deep learning is actually used for particular problem settings. It's used now heavily for inverse problems and also, for instance, for so-called partial differential equations, which are used for modeling natural phenomena. And again, the question concerning reliability you can ask is how do you use neural networks in a reliable manner? Because right now, as we saw, I mean, there are still certain problems which we observe. And so let me show you one approach also in this direction to indicate how you can actually ensure reliability for such problem settings in imaging. Now, modern imaging, I'm sure you know it's an exciting area. We have a lot of imaging modalities. We have a lot of different tasks to solve. And so the very classical approach is as follows. So this is what an what typically in imaging happens. So all almost all tasks in imaging are so-called inverse problem. Something happened to the image and you want to reverse it. Yeah? So for instance, some parts are taken out of the image and you want to invert it. So this operator K here, it could be, for instance, a measurement operator. It could be something which affects the image and so on. And each time the question is, Given G, can I get my F back? Oh, and so a classical problem solver is uh, to minimize these terms. You see here, if you take an F which minimize this, what it means is you aim to solve this in inverse from as close as possible, because the best you can do is to set this to zero. And then you have another term where you can incorporate properties of the solution, because you can imagine here, I mean, you can fill in these black parts as you want. So what you need is you need some specific properties of your original image. And so this is where this regularization term comes into play. And here, this is what's called sparse regularization. You choose a representation system, these phi i, where you know that natural images get or give a sparse or get a sparse representation of and then put the L1 on one. So this is a very classical approach. So let me just say what, what type of phi i you could, for instance, use here. You can use wavelets, as we already saw. You can use also other systems, since typically in imaging, directions are important. And let me go back. We saw that these wavelets are more like a square. So there is an adaption of wavelets, which is a bit better for natural images. Um, so which which are shearlets, which are a rich system, so that you get such a shield on each point in the plane, you get it in each, let's say, scale and also in each direction. And so you can show that, in fact, I mean, with these shields, you get optimal compression rates um, for certain model classes for functions. So shields, in that sense, are in that 
in a certain sense, optimal for handling images and for efficient representations of images. And yeah, we have some algorithms on this web page if you're interested. Now we can use this if we go back for, yeah, so we can put it in here in this phi i and use this path regularization. And I would like to show you now this application where we see that this approach actually reaches the limit and then we can use neural networks and we use it in a reliable manner. Uh, so this is what I would like to advocate. So here the, the problem is um, a CT scanner. So what does this CT scanner do? Well, I mean, you have the human body here. We compute line integrals through it. This gives me one slice of the sinogram. So this you see now here, it's one slice. And then you rotate this device. So for each rotation angle, you get again a 1D function and you get another slice of the sinogram. So this way you build up the sinogram and from this you would like to recover now the interior of the human body. So these are the measurements which a CT scanner takes. But now, I mean, you have a problem because often in many applications you cannot do 180 degrees. So what you have is you have a part missing here. And still you need to reconstruct. And this, if we go by the sparse regularization, for instance with Shearlitz, usually this behaves extremely well, but you see here, if this is my original image and now in the measurements I have a 60 degree missing angle, then you see a crude reconstruction looks really awful, but even a very good reconstruction like this sparse regularization with Shielitz still is not optimal. You see here, if you compare the details, you see here a lot of problems in this area, also in this area here and in general. And no matter what you take from all these classical approaches, you will always see these problems because there's this huge chunk of missing data. And now using neural networks, we can resolve this. Yeah, so that's the problem data is too complex for, for modeling. And so, I mean, you can combine now neural networks with um, classical methods in various manners. The easiest would be to just throw everything overboard and just use a neural network. So you have your measurements and you train on your neural network just from these measurements to reconstruct your original data. This I would not propose because you're losing a lot of structure that way. You have actually typically a lot of physical knowledge. So this you should use and not let the neural network learn everything anew. Also, the neural net, also you don't need that many data points because typically, for instance, in medical imaging, you have the problem that you have only very few training data. And so if you use a bit more physics and bring that into a game, into the game, then you can do significantly better. Now, but there are various instances how to combine both here. So you see, you can use a new network after your model-based approach. You can open your solvers and insert new networks at some points. You can also use uh, images generated by neural networks as a regular surprise and so on. So let me just show you one strategy, which uh, we typically advocate which is first using the model-based approach, the classical approach, as far as it is possible and as far as it is reliable, and then use the AI-based method only where it's necessary, uh, and then combine both worlds. Uh, so just use the deep neural network surgically. And so this has many advantages. You get better performance for better end input and so on. So let me show you also then the results. I mean, we need use typically here a unit, which is um, yeah a certain type of neural network with so-called skip connections. <coughs> um, so what what we use here is for the first step we solve with sparse regularization with shields. This is what 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 I showed you for the classical approach, we use uh, the AI, the deep neural network to recover the missing components and then we combine both. What is behind this and what you see here is that 
I mean, depending on the scanning direction, you see already certain edges and others are smeared out. And so based on that, you can decide where to precisely place your neural network to recover only those which you would like, which you don't get otherwise. And so here you see, for instance, results, the top line you already saw, these are the model-based methods. If you have a 60 degree missing angle and here you see now an end-to-end -end approach, not using any physical knowledge, just training a neural network end-to-end. -end. But if you combine both, you see you can do a significantly better job. And so this philosophy of using let's say model-based approach as far as they are reliable, combining them uh, in a surgical manner with neural networks. You see also here, it's a very classical task, edge detection. This is what a classical approach does and the color coding is indicates the direction of the edge. And this is, again, when you combine both worlds, you see very precisely the edges and their directions. Um, so here we use first, I mean, a certain shielded transform to also bring the data into a space where the features are more revealed. And then we use a neural network in a certain manner on those. We train it in a different domain. And so this is what I did. Okay, so, uh, so I showed you generalization, explainability, these are, these are key, let's say, aspects of reliability. I showed you in this application where we can, let's say, design the approach so that reliability to a certain extent is still ensured. And at last, I would like to also very briefly talk about limitations, because I think this is a very important aspect which is usually overlooked. And this is, I think, from my viewpoint also, I mean, one actually key aspect of reliability. Because Artificial intelligence is actually not a Swiss Army knife. It has limitations, and I think this needs to be really carefully assessed. And there are different directions you can go. What I would like to just very briefly show you here is the analysis of the fact that we train our neural networks on digital hardware. No? So your laptop in front of you, for instance, GPUs, and so on. And the question is, does this have limitations? And in fact, it does. So you can model digital hardware as a Turing machine. And then what we could show is that certain problems, like for instance, inverse problems, are not Turing computable and in fact not even Banach Masur computable, which is actually a stronger statement. So there is no possibility to train a neural network with arbitrary occurrence. Uh, so this causes, I mean, a serious problem for reliability for AI because what you would like is uh, you would like to really get your result with an arbitrary accuracy. But here we could even show that there is typically a range where I mean you cannot even decide and analyze how close you are to the optimum. Yeah, and so this could point towards also why we see these instabilities and non-robustness. And there are various other instances, not only solutions of inverse problems, but also certain classification problems and so on, which all cause, cause these difficulties that this is not computable on digital hardware. So what now? I mean, but also their theory tells us the way. And in fact, it tells us that we can compute it on an analog machine. It's an analog machine. We have the Turing machine for the digital world, and this is an analog machine, a show called Bloom Troops Mail Machine. So this points towards that maybe reliability for certain problem settings in AI requires actually novel hardware. And there are very promising directions concerning analog hardware, neuromorphic computing, biocomputing, also quantum computing in Munich, we have this Munich quantum valley, and so on. So the vision for the future is certainly truly reliable AI, but maybe it even entails going to new hardware platforms. So let me finish with some conclusions. Um, from my viewpoint, I mean, AI shows impressive performance in real life applications, but one major problem which still needs to be solved is reliability of AI technology. 
I then showed you, I mean, from a mathematical perspective, um, these are key questions one would need to analyze, expressivity learning. Important for reliability is in particular generalization bounds, generalization errors, and also explainability. So understanding how decisions are reached. We then went a bit into applications and I showed you that if you would like to get a, let's say, more or less reliable approach, it is the best to use a classical model-based approach as far as reliable because there you have a lot of error guarantees and only use the neural network then in a surgical manner where the other approach cannot go any further. And finally, we discussed a bit that there are still problems with reliability if you train on data counters. So there are other aspects which are usually swept under the rug or not really considered, which could even be a profound problem for reliability. Let me also say, since I now talked a lot about reliability, um, we just opened a school in this direction. It is a master program and also a PhD program. The so Konrad Zul School of Excellence Reliable AI in Munich. It's between both universities, LMU and TUM. And uh, it has various application areas. I mean, medicine, healthcare, robotics, algorithmic decision making, but also the theoretical component. We just actually have a call for PhD positions. So if you or anyone is interested, I mean, please please apply. You can also contact me if you have any questions. And with this, I'd like to conclude and thanks a lot for your attention. So thanks a lot for your uh, good presentation. So many, many questions here. So let me see. Um, let's start with the online audience as usual, I would say. So, um, did you see raising hands there or not? Maybe not. Maybe they were just clapped. Well, I'll, I'll... I mean, I can, I can... so should I, should I change to, so that I can see you or? Sure. You can, you can uh, stop sharing, for example. Yeah. Okay. Sure that, right. So good. So any questions from the line audience? I can break the ice myself with that. So, uh, so I have a question related to, uh, you know, uh, your slides on, uh, some of the slides on the, the shear left. Yeah. So you had that F alpha function, the F alpha uh, thing, right? That you defined as, you know, your, uh, um, uh, when you talk about the phi i, how to choose the phi i and, uh, and so on, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so now, uh, let me try to uh, put that into, uh, to, to understand that into the context of your uh, first or second slide, that of alchemy. So to me, the choice of the phi i is a little bit of alchemy. Because you never you never go and and try all possible functions. So your hypothesis uh, your hypothesis set I don't call it, it it's never everything right. It's, you make a choice there, and that's basically alchemy because you, you don't have a mathematical procedure which makes you choose that. It's true that maybe you know that you know maybe certain types of uh, uh, basis is better. Okay, well yeah true, but then you just make a choice. Yeah, so. So, so, so let me say, I mean, so here, you know, that in certain model settings, so for instance, these cartoon like functions, which are a model for natural images, you can actually show that this, these, these shields uh, are optimal. So in that sense, I wouldn't call it actually alchemy. So you make a rational choice. You have results, which show some optimal criteria. So therefore, I mean, these model based approaches from my perspective, I mean, these are approaches which are based on a theoretical understanding. But, but, but you know, there is, you know, there is in, in general, the choice of the basis is, is somehow, you know, um, a, a, a choice that you that you make, right? So let's say you you try to solve, uh, let's say now there are these methods that try to, you know, um, uh, solve uh, uh, partial differential equations and so on they use they, they tend to use a basis function at the end and of course uh, of course uh, uh, there are criteria for which uh, that basis function is the best one but in, mm -hmm. but in, as a general fact there is a lot there is a bit of art there let's say maybe not alchemy but a little bit of art because you you figure out first a little bit the at least in general sense you you, you figure out somehow the, the where you have to go before uh, you know, doing some math because then, of course, then you have the two terms 
and then it must be there. Right? Those two terms must be there. And then the optimization is all like theoretically funded. But for me, like how to choose, what to choose at that point, it's a little bit, uh, you know, a, 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 a something that you figure it out with a little bit of intuition and not always with some sort of well-funded uh, theoretical, uh, theoretical things. Now, in that case, you explain, well, there is a theorem there, but yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, in that sense, I agree with you. I mean, um, if you, let's say, just put some regularization term, you don't have any theoretical underpinning. Yeah, so then it's a bit like acrimony, a lot of experience, then it, it could be comparable to many areas in, in AI. That's right, yeah. And then for the heuristic part, there is a beautiful book by Judea Perl on heuristics. So for those which want to read the about heuristics, that's one for book reading. Yeah. Questions? So, it's Jenny. Hello. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thank you very much for a great talk. Um, I was wondering if you could go a little bit more into the generalization result on the graphical networks that you've shown us. Um, in particular, I'm interested if it gives non vacuous bounds, because I know that in neural networks, the VC dimension is so high that often for the real networks, if we apply it, mm -hmm. it will give us something larger than one. So we cannot basically even use that theory. So I was wondering how does it works with the graphical networks? So here, I mean, the result I showed you gives quite accurate bounds. So we, I mean, I, 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 I didn't show you any numerical examples, but you see from the numerical examples that you also see um that they are quite tight and also this trend that it depends linearly on this um laplacian um is you, you can witness also in in practical applications so in that sense i mean there so this is for spectral neural networks where the spectral filters are specifically set up um using so-called functional calculus but for those for that class you can show this result and as said there these bounds are tight but this is, I mean, one special case. Um, now, so it doesn't solve the generalization problem of, in general, of graph neural networks. Okay. But it goes, as I said, I mean, if you have, let's say, graphs which belong to the same class, how the network behaves if it was trained on one and if you then expose it to another one. Oh, yeah. thank you very much. That's very exciting. Well done. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Can you hear me about speed? Yes. Um, okay. So thank you. That was a very fascinating talk. Um, thank you. Um, I have a question about uh, the very last result that, you, that you've mentioned, that if you simulate a neural network with real machines, yes. that you can prove um, that uh, not everything basically is too computable and that we have to go to a different hardware, an analog hardware. Um, so in classical uh, computation theory, we have the things that are less computable will be Turing computable and vice versa. So can you be more specific based on uh, your result uh, where like analog hardware will be superior to like digital hardware? Yeah, I mean, thanks, thanks also for that question. So what I showed you here was, I mean, solving an um, in, in inverse problem. So we, we have this optimization problem and this is what we, how we would like to solve it. And then you can show that there the solution is actually not, not, not computable if you use digital hardware, which is, I mean, the, the, the reason behind is certainly you have, um, let's say a continuous problem to a certain extent. And so on digital hardware, you break it down and you encounter those problems and this bloom snail machine is a model for an analog hardware. Um, but certainly then the quit and, and so there it, it becomes computable, but then certainly the question is, what is the good realization of it? I mean, there are now neuromorphic chips. How close are those to this bloom snail model? If it's close, then, I mean, you could, the result actually shows that, I mean, for, for that, um you hopefully you have a chance to get reliability but this is also an open question so there's this abstract for, for Turing machine you know it models a, a computer what what those we have today but for a bloom tubes mail machine it's not clear which type of hardware that actually will entail it's right now a mathematical model for an analog machine 
Thank you. So, um, so before, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, last couple of minutes for uh, maybe one more question or something like that, I also just mentioned that um, there's been a change in the schedule. So tonight's talk uh, has been moved to Friday morning at 10.30 a.m. Just now. It happened during the talk of Professor Kutinyok. So it just happened now. So we'll send the announcement. Uh, uh, I'll send the announcement uh, uh, this afternoon with uh, all the updated, inf updated information. Um, so let's see if there is any last minute uh, question. So Nate Olson, thanks you for the great talk. Any any other question? Of course, uh, uh, master students here are invited to apply to the PhD program that. Uh, has been uh, recently. It has been uh, recently, you know, developed. Uh, Professor Kutinyok uh, um, uh, Institution. Of course, if they are not worried about the weather, as someone here has uh, underlined. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for an interesting, uh, informative, interesting talk by Dr. Zubovic. So, if there is no other questions, let's thank uh, um, the speaker again for the great uh, for the great talk. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.